In a previous video, we looked at the term structure of interest rates. And the term structure of interest rates relates the term to maturity and the yield to maturity for bonds with the same level of risk. So we usually look at treasury bonds, for example, because they're considered default-free, risk-free. And one of the theories that we had of the term structure, or actually the graph of it, which is referred to as the yield curve, was something referred to as the expectations theory. And the expectations theory essentially says that long-term bond rates reflect current short-term bond rates and expected future short-term bond rates. So let's look at an example here. This is the easiest way to explain it. Suppose you want to invest your money for two years. You've got a couple of choices here. The first strategy is just buy a bond that matures in two years. Okay, Simplest way to do it. The second way to do it is to buy a one-year bond, and when it matures, you buy another one-year bond. So you've invested your money uh, for two years, you've just used two bonds. So when your first bond matures, you just roll over all the proceeds into another one-year bond. And so you've kept your money invested for two years. What the expectations theory says is that these two strategies, you would expect to have the same rate of return at least before the fact. Now, two years from now, you may have found that strategy one was better or strategy two was better, but before the fact, you expect them to be the same. Because if they weren't, if you expected strategy two to be better, then you wouldn't use strategy one, okay? You wouldn't buy the two-year bond. And what would happen to the price of the two-year bond? If people aren't buying it, demand for it goes down. If demand goes down, price goes down. If price goes down, the yield goes up. You're paying a lower price to get the same fixed cash flow, so the return is going to go up. And likewise, if the two-year bond had a better strategy, then or, or everybody thought it was going to return a higher return, then everybody would buy the two-year bond. That would increase the demand, push the price up. If the price went up, the yield would go down. So. These are going to keep adjusting in the t until the two are equivalent. Okay? Again, this is before the fact. After the fact, circumstances may have changed. Uh, interest rates may have gone up higher or faster than we thought a year from now. And so the, one year st the two one-year bonds turns out to be better. Okay? Or they may not have gone up as much as we thought they would, in which case the two-year strategy was better. But before the fact, we expect them to be the same. All right, let's look at a numerical example. Suppose suppose the rate on a one-year bond equals 10%, and that's the rate today. And then let's suppose that the expected rate on a one-year bond next year is expected to be 12 percent. So our question is what should the rate on a two-year bond be. Okay, and by that I mean the annual rate. Well, think about it. If, for example, the two-year bond paid only 10%, who would buy it? You think rates are going to go up next year. So clearly you can see that it seems to be better to buy the two one-year bonds. On the other hand, if the two-year bond had an interest rate of 12%, what would happen? Everybody would want to buy the two-year bond, and so the demand for this would go up, the price would go, would go up, and the yield would go down, so that would drive down the rate on the two-year bond. Intuitively, let's just look at this. 
it seems like you should get somewhere halfway in between these two. Okay, if it's 10% this year and 12% next year, it looks like to get me to lock in the rate for two years, you're gonna to have to give me about 11%. Okay, mathematically, it looks like this. Okay, one plus, and I'll use the notation two here to mean the interest rate uh, on a two-year bond squared, because you're gonna get this for two years, should equal one plus the interest rate on a one-year bond, okay, this year, okay, times one plus the interest rate that's expected, and I'll call that E1, expected next year on a one-year bond. So let's just substitute in here. We're going to have 1.10, times 1.12 is going to equal this. If we want to solve for I2, we're going to have to take the square root of this and then subtract one from both sides. So I2 is going to be equal to, and in fact, I'll just generalize this, 1.10 times 1.12 if we want to get rid of that square root, we're going to have to raise it to the one-half power and then subtract one. Let's see what we get. We're going to get 1.1 times 1.12. Okay, take the square root of that and then subtract one from it and we get 0 0.10 nine nine five okay which is about about eleven percent which is what we said intuitively okay worked out rather nicely and you can extend this to um, more cases okay or more uh, a longer term bond if this were a three-year bond then you would have the interest rate for a three-year bond would be one plus i cubed and then we would have one plus I1, so the interest rate this year, times one plus the interest rate that's expected one year from today, times one plus the interest rate that's expected two years from today. And in order to solve for it, we'd have to raise it to the one third power to get rid of the cube here, and then subtract one. And so what are you doing? You're essentially calculating a geometric average. And I have a tutorial on that if you're not familiar with geometric averages. It turns out that, and we could do the derivation, but I'm going to dispense with that. You could actually derive this and show that, um, that the terms, that when you cross multiply, there's a term that sort of disappears. And the way you can average this out is really with an arithmetic average. So if you just were to add these two numbers up and divide by two in this case, so add the 10 and the 12 together, divide by two, you get a pretty good approximation. So this is actually quite easy to calculate, and we use information like this either to, there's a couple of ways we can do it. We can use do it this way to find the two-year rate, so we think what we have what we expect the one-year rate to be one year from today, or we could compare these two, okay? We know this and we know this, and we can determine what does the market think next year's one-year rate will be. So suppose I told you that the two-year rate was 11%, the one-year rate was 10%, what does the market think next year's one-year rate will be? Well, we would work backwards, and you would find that it has to be 12%. So this is a, a really useful theory of how interest rates work, this, ter this expectations theory. Um, it's not the only theory of the term structure of interest rates, but it seems to be a pretty good one. If you expect rates to go up in the future, you're going to expect you're going to need a higher interest rate to lock in a long-term bond. If you expect interest rates to go down in the future, you'd be willing to expect or accept 
a lower interest rate on a long-term bond simply because you expect rates to go down in the future. So I hope this clarifies or adds to your understanding of the term structure of interest rates and the expectations theory.